Hello and welcome at this installment of the Heritage Open Days 2021, and in particular, a very warm welcome at the Egyptian table. Food in the ancient world was just as important as it is in modern world. In the Egyptian world, in the ancient Egyptian world, food was for everybody. Nourishment was important for the living, for the gods and for the dead. Both living and dead people eat, and indeed both mere mortals and the immortal gods needed nourishment. In Egyptological parlance, because the food for the dead and for the gods needed to be offered to them, food for gods or deceased is known as offerings, and it is usually shown on these richly adorned tables in front of deceased people or gods. This stela a memorial to an Egyptian dignitary shows him in front of an offering table with a very varied and colorful heap of food. This was typical and we will hear more about offerings and feeding the gods and the deceased later on. But most importantly, food in the Egyptian world was of course for the living. The modern Egyptian cuisine still lives on the heritage of the ancient world, even though it has also considerably changed. The modern Egyptian cuisine is very famous and it stands at a crossroads of the African, Asian and Mediterranean food traditions. However, before we tackle the heritage of ancient Egyptian food, we have to get to know it a little bit closer. The Egyptian diet food at disposal of ancient Egyptians reflected the natural resources they had, their fields, their pastures, the river, and to a certain extent also the desert. Mostly people ate what they had on their fields and what they kept in animal husbandry. The Egyptian diet was, generally speaking, varied and rich in protein and fiber. It sounds very modern to us, but not all food was accessible to everyone. For instance, hunting was a prestigious social activity and venison would have therefore been available mostly to Egyptian elites. Likewise, cattle, red meat, was mostly available to the kings, to the elites and of course to the gods. Most people would have eaten red meat only exceptionally. So nutrition for people who were not elite mostly consisted of vegetables, of grains and their source of protein was mainly fish. However, generally, Egypt was considered the land of plenty and as such it entered the ancient tradition in the Bible, in the classical world. Flashbots of Egypt, that's the memory of Egypt as expressed in the Old Testament. For ancient Rome, Egypt was the granary of the empire. But for the Egyptians themselves, food was equally important. And in the ancient Egyptian culture, not only the richness and the variety of food, but also the way people produced and consumed food were important cultural elements. Which sources tell us about the food in ancient Egypt? Well, as with Egypt, usually we are well supplied. We have visual and textual sources. And most interestingly, we also have the food itself. Paintings and drawings, formal and informal, inform us about food production, food storage, and even food preparation in the kitchens, like this bakery shop of Rehmira in the tomb of this important dignitary, a vizier of the 18th dynasty, that is, from about the 14th century BCE, in Western Thebes. So we find people from harvest to granary transporting grain, then we find them working on the Tao, like in this bakery shop, then we find the preparation of beer and wine, for example. And then the harvest, not only of grain, but of fruit and vegetables. Texts then are concerned with people working with food, but very often with deliveries. The Egyptians were usually not paid with any sort of money, even though they used precious metals as a kind of theoretical money, but they were usually paid in supplies, 
in bushels of grain. Therefore, wherever there were workmen or people who were paid or remunerated in some way, there were records of deliveries of grain. Supplies had to be brought for people who worked, whether they built the pyramids of the ancient kingdom or the tombs in the Valley of the Kings of the New Kingdom. So we find lists of edible commodities that had to be supplied to these state paid workmen, grain and fish featuring prominently yet again. From the Old Kingdom Pyramid archives to the village of Dural Medina supplies, we are well informed about the nourishment and the amount of food people were paid. We also find prestigious lists of food used in the royal palaces, from meat to fruit, from beer to wine. And we also hear about family quarrels, such as when members of a family expected to be helped with food supplies or bread preparation. So we hear quite a lot. And then we also have texts concerned with the role of food in everyday life and in culture, whether high or every day. Finally, in Egypt, we find food, loaves of bread, raisins, grapes, even roasted ducks in the tomb of Tutankhamun, from simple supplies in simple burials to prestigious banquets as indeed was the one buried with the king Tutankhamun. Food in Egypt, however, was not only consumed, well, produced first, prepared, and then consumed. It also became part of the symbolic system of the social behavior of cultural norms. And in ancient Egypt, we may reliably talk about table manners. The wisdom texts of ancient Egypt are philosophical texts and ethical precepts informing the educated members of the Egyptian society how to behave. That was their target. And they are very comprehensive. Ethical behavior, professional manners, and the philosophical attitude to life, they may be all subsumed under the heading of a wisdom text. And table manners form a part of this. For example, the teaching of Tahotep, a very frequently copied text, suggests that if one is a guest in a place of one greater than you, well then don't be finicky and accept the food that you are given politely. That is the essence of Tehotep's teaching. So certainly quite a clear example of table manners. Such table manners were not limited to a moment when you were a guest in a house of somebody more important than yourself. But it was also a matter of being generous. As the New Kingdom instruction of Annie makes quite clear, do not eat bread while another stands by without extending your hand to him. And that means that you should not be greedy and you should share the bounty of your food. It will not surprise that a comfortable life involved a plenty of food, that is, avoiding starvation. But what is equally important, that this food should be present in this world and the next, and also that there came obligations. If you had plenty, then you should share. Indeed, most Egyptian biographical texts express this element of sharing and helping others. And one of the most famous, rather formulaic, but very telling statements in the biographies is this. I've given bread to the hungry, I've given drink to the thirsty, and I helped to ferry the one who had no boat, sometimes enhanced by I've provided clothing for the naked. So essentially, I have shared whatever good fortune I had and food and drink were important and articulated very clearly. Well, in this life, comfortable life meant access to varied and plentiful food. And as we've already seen, food was also a means of social communication, feeding your family, feeding your dependents, sharing your good fortune. That was a duty, especially if you were rich and in a position of power. Sharing meals with someone also indicated that you were in a close relationship, blood relatives most probably, or in a friendly relationship. 
a blood relative relationship could have been articulated in different ways. You could be a mother or a son or a daughter or a brother or a sister of somebody. But friendship was very often expressly articulated through sharing food and drink. In one of the letters from the village of Dero Medina, the exceptional village of the builders of royal tombs in the New Kingdom, we read, a man is happy when he is with his old eating companion. As we've just seen, food was an important social marker, especially when shared or partaken in a company of somebody considered close. However, the portrait of sharing and care, as in biographical texts, that was an ideal demonstration, a display of an Egyptian ideal world. In real life, even though no doubt people were supplied by their superiors and occasionally indeed also helped, food represented the marker of social status, whether in terms of a permanent elite status or a temporary special occasion. Choice cuts of meat represented particularly prestigious food and appeared on the tables of the elite and on, of the gods. Wine, equally, was a prestigious beverage, and many wine jars were found in palaces, temples, and elite tombs, and wine jars were often quite nicely decorated, as this example from the tomb of Sanagem from the New Kingdom. The storage jars were marked with the name of the vineyard, the supervisor of the vineyard, and also the vintage, the year. So there was a whole system of wine supplies traveling across Egypt. Most finds demonstrating that the wine came mostly from the Delta are attested again from the New Kingdom, but wine was probably consumed throughout the Egyptian history as a special beverage. Food was important for the living, but it was equally important also for the gods. Providing food for the gods was an essential part of the temple ritual. What happened in the temples? Well, a temple was literally a house of a deity, a god or a goddess, or a divine group, or a divine family. So what happened there was a sequence of daily rituals, we would say an everyday maintenance of the household of the deity, and then there were exceptional feast days with processions and oracles when people had a chance to communicate more directly with their gods. The daily ritual was really like running a household of a deity, and that included feeding the gods, preparing the food, presenting them in front of the divine image in the innermost shrine of the temple, or in case of the sun cult of the very special sun cult of Akhenaten, the um, king of the 18th dynasty, on open altars on the temple courtyards, as this relief reminds us. Unlike in other cultures, the Egyptians did not prefer burnt offerings, where food or even liquid would be just thrown in the fire. But the food was presented to the gods, then it might have been presented in other shrines, for example to the deified kings. Then it could have been even given again to statues of important people, statues located in the temples, at least since the Middle Kingdom. And then finally, when the offerings were thus presented to different divine beings, they were consumed by the priests. This system is known as the reversion of offerings. Eventually, we come to the last important group of consumers of food in the ancient Egyptian culture, the deceased. There were many different ideas about how to achieve and conduct a successful afterlife in the ancient Egypt. Many ideas were concerned with the journey to the netherworld, with the judgment in front of Osiris, but also with a successful eternal life, not just a mere survival there. 
It was important in many of these concepts that the dead were supplied with good food, and this could be achieved by different means, by burying food with them, like the roast duck and wine feast of Tutankhamun, and also by depicting food production in the tombs and chapels. Because in ancient Egypt, a tomb is not just a place of a burial. It is also a place of memory, a place of communication. Most non-royal tombs had a chapel accessible, and the royal tombs then would have had a temple adjacent to a pyramid or further away, as in case of the memorial temples of the New Kingdom. Either way, that was a place where people communicated with the deceased and asked the gods to provide for the deceased. These offering formulae asking the gods to provide for the deceased in the afterlife are plentiful. People were supposed to read them or at least to listen to them and to repeat them. One of the most famous offering formulae is known as the so-called Heteb Dinesu. That is an offering that the king gives so that the gods may provide for the deceased in the afterlife. Let's have a look at a few examples of how the food production and food presentation was shown. We are using paintings from a New Kingdom tomb of Nacht in Upper Egypt in Thebes in the site known as Sheikh Abdel Gurna. Nacht was an important man and his tomb was provided with these beautiful paintings that were to assure that all those comforts of this life would be then kept for Nacht and available to him and to his family also for eternity. So we see Nacht involved in a prestigious activity of hunting that would, however, also provide fish for his table. We see a harvest there, we see the vineyards and wine preparation, we see even the plucking and roasting of uh, the fowl. And then these rich baskets and bowls full of food presented to Nacht and his wife. Here the rich imagery continues with grain harvest and again an offering scene. In this particular case, we see the offering table with bread, but also red meat and fruit and vegetables and indeed even flower decoration. It gives us an idea about an ideal offering table, but to a certain extent also about the prestigious food the ancient Egyptians wanted to see, not only on their table for eternity, but also on the tables of the living. And finally, then, what if everything were to fail? What if the food in the tomb would then be stolen, for example? What if the wall paintings would then flake off? Well, at least the texts, such as the Heteb Dinesu formula, should keep the cult going. People were ideally supposed to come and make the offerings in the chapel, but then this might have happened for a generation or two. And then who would come? Well, hopefully at least visitors attracted to the place and interested in the historical legacy and the sacred space of a tomb. And then they would repeat this offering formula to make sure that the king symbolically would provide for the gods so that the gods symbolically would provide the offerings of bread, oxen, birds, and in short, all good and pure things for gods to live on there. That is also for the deceased, the rations coming in the necropolis for the ka, one of the elements of the Egyptian soul, of the two owner. The wish to assure a good afterlife was overwhelming, and people who may not have had a very nice chapel of their own could even write a little inscription in a sacred space of somebody else. And we find these secondary inscriptions, also known as graffiti, in important temples and tombs, and people very often ask for favors from the gods, including the Heteb Dinesu formula. This is written usually in the name of or even by a living person, but it is written as if they were already on the brink of needing eternal sustenance. And Heteb Dinesu in this case is immortalized 
in their name in an important place under the protection of divine kings and gods. So overwhelming was the need to provide food in the afterlife. We have visited in this short introduction to the Egyptian table, Egypt as a land of plenty. We have seen that it depended mostly on the Nile, but some food could come also from the desert. We have seen that there was a chance for plentiful food in Egypt, but not all food was accessible to everyone. And yet for the Egyptians, food, irrespective of their social status, was important not only as nourishment, but also as a cultural and religious symbol. The importance of food in the Egyptian culture is ongoing, but modern food is both somewhat similar, for example, bread, fish and vegetables still feature largely, but also different. New species reached Egypt in the centuries between the ancient world and the present. From other parts of the world, there came potatoes, tomatoes, coffee, Tea. So modern Egyptian cuisine is excellent, but it is not exactly the cuisine of the pharaohs. And yet, one important tradition goes on. Most of the food depends on the Nile. Thank you for taking part in this quick tour of the Egyptian world of food. After all, Egypt never stops inspiring.